Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik for Breakthrough News, and this is Dispatches. As Israeli violence against Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem heats up amid looming evictions of Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah and the Israelis storming the Al Aqsa Mosque, I am joined by on the ground investigative journalist David Sheen coming to us from Haifa for insight into the Israeli side of the equation. Uh, why is this happening now? What are the Israeli political divisions and machinations driving the violence? Uh, David is one of the best experts probably to talk about Israel's lurch to the far right. So David, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on the show. It's good to be here. So I want to start off by talking about, you know, we're recording this on what's called Jerusalem Day. Um, and as we're speaking, I imagine there's probably groups of uh, these far right settlers in occupied East Jerusalem that are preparing to do their yearly march for Jerusalem Day uh, to celebrate what they believe is the reunification of Jerusalem when Israel captured the eastern half in 1967, has occupied it ever since. You've covered this day um, years, well, over the years, actually, um, and covered the extremism that takes place. And I think this is kind of the perfect thing to start on because it plays into everything else happening in Jerusalem. So can you describe to our listeners and viewers what is Jerusalem Day and what typically happens on this day and why it's a pretty much a huge provocation that people are worried will lead to more violence? Mm. Sure. Look, it's very simple. It's the day that is like the biggest holiday of the year for the settler movement. It's like the settler holiday because it's the day they celebrate the expansion of Israel to its, well, to, to its largest set of borders. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the settler movement aspires to not only for Israel to occupy all the you know, areas it does today, but also um, to expand those borders and internally to exile the non-Jews from those borders. And they see the, the holy esplanade or the Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary, the compound of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. They see that as the pinnacle of their dreams. They, and also what, angers them the most to see a symbol of non-Jewry, of Islam in this case, atop what to them is the most holy place on earth. Because thousands of years ago, there were Jewish temples there. That hasn't been the case for 2000 years. Uh, you know, 600 years after the last Jewish temple there existed, it's the building of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. So for 1400 years, that's been the reality on the ground. And for the, you know, for the religious movement, for the settler, you know, let's call them the national religious, okay? It's, we haven't really spoken about Israeli society and how that breaks down into camps. And I can speak a little bit about that, but the easiest way to break it down is just to understand there's, there's four camps, let's say from left to right, there's a teeny tiny socialist camp, you know, exactly. a very, 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 very small liberal camp. And then the largest, section of Israeli society, I'll call them the uh, domination camp, and they you know, want apartheid to continue. Uh, and then on the, on the far right, there is the religious camp, and they want not only for there to be an apartheid state, but for that apartheid state to be ethnically cleansed of non-Jews. So the largest section of Israeli society really is this secular nationalist, make up about 60-65% of Israeli Jewish society. And then, you know, about 20% are these um, religious parties and religious population that, as I said, for the most part, wants to expand the borders, kick out the non-Jews, and turn this 1,400-year-old mosque, the most holy place, in, the third most holy place in Islam, and certainly the most beautiful building in the country, to demolish it and to turn it into a Jewish temple and should be noted an abattoir because the aspiration is that this temple would not be a place where people come and pray, uh, either standing or kneeling, but rather slaughtering uh, animals, specifically tens of thousands at a time on Jewish holidays. So to turn that, that place, that which is right now a holy Muslim sanctuary, into a temple slash abattoir. That's the goal 
And that is what is being celebrated. And if we were in the streets of Jerusalem right now, we would see young Jewish men wearing t-shirts and emblazoned on them are images or illustrations of the temple, temple of past and the temple that they wish to create. They're, they're openly advertising this, you know, this parade, it should be said, I, I don't want to take up too, yeah, I don't want to let no, you, no, no, you no, no, no. I think it's important because it's, this is a parade that is going to, it, it's obviously, it's a very provocative parade because it's like this, this, this particular ideology, these particular people are the ones marching through the streets. They typically march through Palestinian neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and they're chanting for taking over the Al-Aqsa Mosque, rebuilding this, what they call the third temple. Um, and also, you know, they'll chant death to Arabs and mm -hmm. these kinds of genocidal chants, um, wanting to take over, expand the borders, as you say. Um, and I think it's important that that ties into the Al-Aqsa Mosque because these that's what these provocations as well are about at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I mean, so this morning, this morning there was these huge provocations at the Al-Aqsa Mosque where the Israeli police basically stormed it. The images coming out were pretty shocking. Um, does that play into this idea of taking over? Like, what's that about? Mm. Why, why did they storm the mosque? Mm -hmm. Look, um, there's a long history of what, what's been happening there. It's hard to you know, compress it into just a few words, but let's just look at the last few weeks and few months of what's been happening on the mosque. We have right now in Israel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of just put a point in the temple and in the of mosque course, of and, course, yeah. end, and then come back to it, but just to yeah. explain the moment we're at. So yeah. the moment we're at in Israeli society is a crisis of the Knesset. Right now, we are between elections. We just had elections. In fact, we just had four elections in a row, one after the other in the last two years. And the main re so this election cycle is what's been affecting what's happening on the mount. I'll take a couple minutes just to explain no, no, the election cycle. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. all right. And then how it gets to the to the to the Alexa Mosque. So, as some of our listeners may know, um, the Prime Minister of Israel for the last twelve odd years has been Benjamin Netanyahu. He's actually ruled the country for most of the last quarter century. Um, and so in any, in any case, you know, most of the time that he's been in power, actually, just when he was elected in Israel, a Democratic president was elected in the White House in the United States. And so because of that, it inhibited Netanyahu every time he comes, then, you know, first time he's elected, Clinton's elected. Ah, oh, so he can't really, you know, push through all of his aspirations, everything that he wants to do. You know, he's obviously like a far right nationalist in Israel. So... He, but he can't, you know, annex all the territory he wants because he's inhibited by, you know, trying to please the American president. Okay, second time he gets elected in 2009, again, same issue in the White House is Barack Obama. So he can't do everything that he wants to. He's got to pretend, you know, he's got to give lip service to the two-state solution, all the while increasing the annexation little by little. And of course, the, the settlers on the ground you know, in, in advancing and creating settlement outposts. So even without him, you know, making large moves, it's still happening incrementally and quietly without any protests from anywhere, as long as he just gives lip service. So right. that's what happens until the end of Obama. Mm -hmm. Of course, once Trump's in power, you know, it's a completely different story. The, whatever you he know, wants. He gets yeah. whatever he wants. And more, actually, yeah. if you think that the United States ambassador to Israel is probably more right wing than Netanyahu, David Friedman, who was under Trump, the ambassador to the United States, is a, we'll call him a pastel kahanist, you know, someone who has already, <laughs> you know, contributed, and Jared Kushner, I might add, contributed money to kahanist causes, you know. Money that money that was funneled to Kahana's institutions, uh, you know. So, and Kahana, we're talking about the most extreme racists, you know, genocidally. I, I, we'll call them uh, ge genocidal aspirants, you know. Okay. So th that, that's the kind of people that David Friedman, U.S. ambassador to Israel, is funding, Jared Kushner's funding. Once he, you know, is made ambassador to Israel, he's given a free, an open check to, you know, to steer U.S.-Israeli policy in the Middle East. Now, you know, a hard lurch to the right, you know, annex... You know, we can say we, that the U.S. accepts the annexation of East Jerusalem. The U.S. accepts the annexation of the Golan Heights. 
with America, with the White House behind him and, and you know, pushing to the right, we've seen in the last several years more and more and more and more and more increasing annexation and increasing uh, the, the Jewish supremacy inside 48 Israel in the sense of passing the nation state law, making apartheid explicit. If, if it was de facto in the field, now it's just dropping the mask and being open mm -hmm. and honest about it because with Trump's support, there's no need to, to be shy about it and, and far right folks being elected in other parts of the world. Okay, so now where are we? All of a sudden, Trump's gone. On the Israeli side, Netanyahu is in court because turns out there are allegations against him for massive, massive corruption. So he's now being tried in an Israeli court on these corruption charges. Because of that, his allies, those who have helped him stay in power for the last 12 years, have started to back away. When I say his allies, I mean the secular allies, his fellow Dominant apartheid lovers, you know, those who want to. Because Netanyahu's not Netanyahu's not the religious. He's not like a religious exactly. extremist, right? Yeah. Exactly. He's very secular himself. I mean, you know, he'll he'll put on a skull cap and he'll he'll perform. He'll perform <laughs> exactly. But you know, it's it's known. It's not it's not a secret that he's you know lives a secular lifestyle and he's the head of the secular nationalist camp, the largest camp in Israel. So the issue is that now that you know, it's pretty obvious that, you know, what's it obvious? He's up on corruption charges and the evidence against him that's been published in Israeli media is very convincing, let's just say. So his secular nationalist allies have started one by one to back away from him. The only ones who stayed by him are the religious parties. So he had to call an election. And what's happened over and over and over again is that Netanyahu can't get enough seats to make a majority. Again and again, the religious parties stick with him and the secular parties don't. Now, shouldn't that mean then that the other secular parties are able to form a government if they're not, you know, if Netanyahu can't reach 50%, surely the other parties must be able to. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, here we come into the, you know, the third rail of Israeli politics, which is, uh, you know, hating non-Jews, hating Muslims, hating Christians, hating Arabs, hating Palestinians. And so, no government can ever be made with, you know, a Palestinian party or a mm. party representing the Palestinian citizens of Israel. It's never happened. And it's because of racism. Right. <laughs> and so at this point, these Israeli parties, they have an opportunity to kick Netanyahu out. You know, it, he's to become tyrannical. He controls the media. Like, even by Israeli standards, people are sick and tired of him. But, you know, I always yeah. like to think of it as he's really just fitting in very well with his neighborhood, because he's kind of just like <laughs> another... No, seriously, I mean, he's really <laughs> he just adapted to becoming another Middle Eastern authoritarian kind of <laughs> style <laughs> leader, <laughs> like his Gulf allies. But anyways, continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. But I mean, the, the, the thing is that he's now, you know, if, if he was corrupt before, now because he's in this place where he's desperate to stay out of jail and to stay in the in prime power. minister's office, exactly. He'll do anything to stay in power at this point. He's, he's, he's starting to lose it, right? Right. And, and it's because of this that at this moment, so for the last two years, Netanyahu realizes he can't make a government without every single possible right-wing vote. Mm -hmm. And that means, uh, that means bringing in the Kahanist party, the party that openly expresses, you know, says we are the inheritors of the arch-racist rabbi, American-Israeli rabbi, Mayor Kahana. And you know, the, the kind of the founding father of Israeli fascism, someone who, you know, came to the to Israel and in 1980s became a member of Knesset. And he really changed Israeli society in the sense that he openly, openly, enthusiastically uh, called for ethnically cleansing the country of non-Jews. Of course, it had happened already in 48 in the Nakba, and it had already been written about in government memos, but it had never been spoken about, you know, maybe in, you know, quiet conversations, but openly, proudly, this was breaking a taboo in Israeli society. But once he'd broken it, uh, it you know, th that's it. It became a new reality in which it was okay to say those things. And of course he's had inheritors. So those who fall, you know, and, and for the last 
uh, you know, 30 years, he's actually, he, he was assassinated uh, in New York in 1990, but he, he has followers and his mm -hmm. followers are responsible for murdering more than 50 Palestinians in Palestine. So they're the Jewish political party that, you know, has the most blood on their hands, you know, over 60 murders, over 50 Palestinians in Palestine. And, and so this party that, you know, had always been the most furthest uh, party and most reviled and people were embarrassed to be associated with it. And didn't, you know, it was like a euphemism for Nazism when it, you know, when, when an Israeli journalist called one of these guys a Nazi, actually the current leader of the party, um, the guy, sued, he sued the journalist for libel. How dare you call me a Nazi? This is horrendous. A Jewish person, you're calling me a Nazi? And the court, in fact, it went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed. That he was a Nazi. In, well, no, no, no. Well, not, not exactly. Oh. Not exactly. The Supreme Court, well, you're close. The Supreme Court agreed. Okay, it's true. You were libeled. It is libelous oh. to call you a Nazi. It okay. is. But the punishment... For doing so, you will only be fined one shekel. Which is <laughs> <laughs> so they so thought they were like, like, this guy's totally a Nazi. They, even they were <laughs> like, this guy's definitely a Nazi. Yeah. It, like, look, Israel's legislative and judicial bodies have openly, you know, called these parties Nazis. They were uh, officially de designated as terrorists, as a terrorist group by the Israeli government in 1994 after they, uh, you know, um, someone who had already stood as a, as a candidate for Knesset from their party, uh, massacred 29 Palestinian men and boys in the, in the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron in 1994. So this, this movement, all for, for decades, it's had the objective of attacking the holy places, mm -hmm. the Muslim holy, the places that are holy to both Muslims and Jews, to physically attack them, and with the objective of enraging a billion Muslims all over the world so that a, you know, a war will break out and that there will be oh. a clearly defined Jewish side and non-Jewish side, and then it'll be all out war. And of course, in their apocalyptic vision that you know, follows that is Jewish dominion over- Sounds like you have yourself a Jewish ISIS. Yeah, oh, no, definitely, no doubt. Yeah. That, I don't say that, that lightly. I don't say that lightly either. I mean, these people are like, they want like religious law as well. Of course, yes, yes they, I, that's, thanks for asking. They want a theocracy. It's not just that they want the country ethnically cleansed. Many secular Israeli Jews, you know, do not realize that these folks want to turn Israel into a, like with the rules of the Torah and the Talmud, and of course, only the most extreme interpretations of them, the most racist interpretations of religious law. They want them to be the law of the land. Um, so, it's total <laughs> so you have your secular Zionism and your religious Zionism, mm -hmm. and it sounds yeah. like there's a bit of a str maybe not a struggle because it sounds like the seculars don't really understand the danger mm -hmm. of the takeover of the religious mm -hmm. Zionism. But back to Netanyahu, real quick, because mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. you were going with this, right? Yeah. From what I so he brings them some, into the government. So, you, well, so sorry, what I've, from what I've seen from some observers is mm -hmm. that um, is that what's taking these provocations? Because these are like really crazy provocations by the Israeli mm -hmm. police. Mm. Um, as well as settlers, but mm. you know, the speeding up of the evictions, though those have been like oh. deferred for now, I think because of the international outrage. But mm. the fact that, like you said, Netanyahu has not been able to form a government. And so the the um insinuation I've seen or the suggestion has been that he's trying to indirectly through like proxy so he can maintain some level of deniability to escalate tension in order to prevent um a unity government that does not include him whether that's possible or not i don't know if you agree with that or not but um the idea is that he's provoking the entire right um including those who are actually sick of him in order to kind of corner them um into being with him to prevent any sort of progress where he's not um you know protected by his by his position in government. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? You know, look, I, I, uh, it's difficult for me to make those kinds of projections, but historically, whenever the government seemed to be going, I'm not gonna call it a left-wing direction, but they- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not crazy, I'm not as crazy right-wing direction. <laughs> yes, like. exactly, exactly. <laughs> as soon as it seems like uh, the acceleration, you know, we're reducing the acceleration to the right, to the far yeah. right, uh, and, you know, pulling our foot off the pedal, to the far right, it that's when uh, you know far right Jews go and make a provocation 
on the Temple Mount or on the Ibrahimi Mosque. For example, as I just described, in 1994, that's exactly when the Oslo peace process started. Once this attack by Kahanist you know, massacred 29 Palestinians, 40 days after that, which is the Muslim mourning period of 40 days, exactly 40 days after that, began the Hamas you know, uh, suicide bombing series. So again, that's, that's then. Then, okay, let's say fast forward to the year 2000. Again, once again, Netanyahu is voted out of power. And so we have like an attempt to revive the Oslo peace process, the labor government. And again, you know, Ariel Sharon going up to the temple and other, you know, trying to exacerbate and anger Palestinians, you know, over the Temple Mount, over the uh, Holy Esplanade. I'm used to using Israeli jargon at this point from following <laughs> Israeli media. But, uh, and then so then now it's the same thing, you know, because now a third situation where it just looks like Netanyahu finally will be ousted and another teeny, you know, slightly less right-wing government, certainly right-wing, but slightly less right-wing government. You know, of course, the right-wing interprets this as the far left. And so, again, provocations on the Holy Esplanade in, and in East Jerusalem and attacking Palestinians. And it's not only, it's, it, it's not only the last few days, it's the last week and the last few months. And in fact, I would say since winter solstice is when it began, December 21, 2021, um, 2020, the year 2020. So just going back five, six months, that, that's when you had Kahanists you know, just every other night r running rampant through the streets of East Jerusalem and throughout the West Bank, attacking Palestinians, assaulting them. And, you know, they, they were drawing you know, hundreds of thousands of people into the streets. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, the idea is, yeah, escalate, escalate the battle. Um, as like I said, they, they want it's like the they want, It's like they're trying to start a war. It's like, it's like they're trying they to do. start... A provoke they like an, a third intifada like they want to provoke. that's what they want that's what because then they can say all palestinians are evil right, and so right. all we can do is just mow them all down and you know they become very black and white this is also of course like there's also this thing happening in the backdrop that's been happening for years which is what is called or considered the sort of judaization of mm. occupied east jerusalem right you have these mm. settlers um that you know people are kicked palestinians are kicked out of their homes they're evicted and then settlers come and move in, sometimes settlers from America, um, mm -hmm. other times settlers from other parts of Israel. Uh, but so I guess I just I want to ask from the Israeli side of things with the issue of Sheikh Jarrah. Um, there's these settlers, these settler organizations that have been trying to get these Palestinians evicted. What is this like focus or this? Um, importance of this Jewish right to return, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, is there, like, I don't know, is there, they seem to be making a really big deal, or is it just a part of the bigger picture of trying to yeah. surround Palestinians and make them, like, leave the area? Yeah. Well, from my analysis of the Israeli far right, they, there's a few fronts on which they fight. You know, one of them is, as we said, the Holy Esplanade, the Haram al-Sharif. Another one is East Jerusalem because you know, they see those as key battles, but there's other key fronts that they also are eager to you know, throw their forces at, like for example, Yaffa, you know, Akka, towns where, and there's very few of these, of course, but uh, Lid, Ramle, places where you know, the Jews and Palestinians are actually living in the same towns as opposed to most of the towns in the country that are either like 99% Jewish or 100% Jewish or 100% 99% Palestinian. So there's just a few towns. So they will send um, folks, you know, families and a religious leader into a Palestinian community or a mixed Palestinian Jewish community with the objective of you know, separating the, the, the fam not just the community, but families, you know, because they are against miscegenation. So they will right. move into a community, they will try to ramp up the religious sentiment amongst the Jews there so that they will feel separate from their Palestinian neighbors and actually like, you know, mis anti miscegenation campaigns. So there's all kinds of fronts, but certainly East Jerusalem is an important. So it's just front. one of many. It's, it's one just of one, many. The one getting friends. the most attention right now. At this moment, and then uh, you know, pretty soon there'll be another one. But what's interesting right now, I'm sure that you know, other folks have noticed this as well, is that it doesn't always happen 
that Palestinians in other parts of the country, you know, wake up and stand up and speak out. But somehow, maybe this is just the straw that broke the camel's back. And so all of a sudden, in this case, um, you know, tensions are so afraid that now you have like Palestinians here in Haifa, in Nazareth, and in other, Ramallah and Gaza, of course, other parts of the country, but also in 48, standing up and speaking out and posting about this and going out to the streets and demonstrate, you know, folks were beaten by police here in Haifa yesterday and, you know, some arrested, some injured. So, so I, it's interesting that, that the East Jerusalem, the issue of Sheikh Jarrah is, is actually this time managing to bring people out to the street. I, I don't, I, I just think that this is the first flashpoint post yeah. the Kahanists coming to the parliament. You know, th th this is now being whitewashed. This is now being mainstreamed, you know. Two years ago when Netanyahu started to bring the Kahanists into government, there was, you know, an, uh, uh, you know, some mainstream Jewish groups were kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm, we're embarrassed by all this. But now you won't see even a mention of this. It's normal. Be it's normalized for the Kahanists to be part of the parliament and part of the government. The most, you know, th those who's, openly call for ethnic cleansing. They're part of the Israeli parliament and it's normalized. And so people are, I mean, this is my sense, of course, I'm, I'm sure, you know, speaking to other people, they'll have different senses, but my sense is th it's just so far gone at this point. It's like our Charlottesville moments, you know, so people are speaking out and coming out. And, and I, I think it could actually spiral into something much bigger. We could see much more violence yeah. uh, in the days to come. Well, it does seem like also you've been mentioning these people are in government. I don't know if this person's a Kahanist. There's the right wing deputy mayor. De deputy mayor. Am I saying this right? Arya King. Arya King. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is this person a Kahanist? I'm not even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So yeah, yeah. I just wanted to show this. This was pretty shocking to me. Um, mm -hmm. Let me make sure I have the right video. This was pretty shocking to me to see because. I guess it shouldn't be shocking given the kinds of I've been following like your coverage for a long time and Israelis say really crazy things on camera. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be no uh no yeah. filter. No filter. Um, but I just wanted to share this one and yes. get your take on it. Um, Please. can you see this? I can. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the sound on. And this is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. For some reason, uh -huh. the sound is not turning on. That's annoying. I don't know why, because it was just working. Hmm. Let me try this one more time. Okay. okay. Um, let me undo, let me remove that. I'll just have to edit this out. Okay. Let me try. Yeah. You, again. You, you, oh, I see because the computer, no, I don't know. Hang on. Let me try to share this one more time. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I have to share audio. No, it's still not working. I don't know why. Okay, I guess we're not going to look at this, but okay. what else? No, no, let me, let, me, let, me, let me say a couple words, if you don't mind. Okay. All right, go look, for it. Um, Hang on, let me just get this I off have, the screen. Now sure. now say your words, and we can edit that out. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I've seen the video you're speaking about with Arya King, um, where he's calling for, yalla, yalla, let's uh, see you get shot in the head. He's calling for someone to be shot in the Palestinian, right in front of him, openly, calling for him to be assassinated. So... I, 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 you know, my tolerance level is so low at this point because this is just like I'm inundated with videos like this all the time. But just to give you a sense of who this person is, you're discovering him for the first time. I'm happy to tell you a little bit of backstory. So first of all, yes, he himself, you know, has been a city councilor and a deputy mayor of Jerusalem for some time. Um, and yes, you know, he is part of the Kahana slate in Jerusalem City Council. Uh, now, I just sent you a little video. I don't know if you want to play that, but Let's it's a, a short video of, that I uh, subtitled of Arya King, the same deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Are you able to see that? Is it on? Hang on, I'm looking. I just, right I just WhatsApped it to you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just opening the application. All right, let's see. Okay, I will go ahead and play it. Okay. Ah. Let me just put it in. Here we go. I think I'm still, hang on. This is the video, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's like three minutes. Which part should I play? Just the beginning? No, just, uh, 
Let's see where to. Let me turn it up too. So this is some information about. Yeah, I'm just saying who he is. And then I'm, this is just to give you the context, okay? Oh, when he's speaking in Hebrew. Uh -oh. He is. You don't have to play this. But yeah, actually, no, because it's not it. going to work for, for listening purposes, okay. but okay. I do want to totally check that out understand. later. Okay. I'll just edit okay. all this out. No, it's no problem. Feel it's free to deal. use whatever segment you want, but just to give you a sense of who this no, man I, is. I'll keep that open. Um, okay. But yeah, so this person. 20... Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So you're scandalized by him calling to the, you know, a general, yalla, yalla, you should be shot. Okay. But he's been doing this for years. And not just, uh, you know, in, in a kind of tit for tat way, but also when standing in front of hundreds of young people, like telling them, go out and kill and torture Palestinians. And he did this hours. On video. Uh, yes, on video. And he did this just hours before Mohammed Abu Khader was kidnapped, you know, Palestinian teenager in, in East Jerusalem was kidnapped outside his home in the summer of 2014 and dragged into a, into a car and driven to a forest where he was you know, beaten. Uh, gasoline was forced down his throat and he was torched to death from the inside out by uh, And this Jewish guy is now this. deputy. This and guy the day, the, the, the yes, Hours before, hours before, that's correct. Hours before this took place, he stood in front of you know hundreds of young religious Jewish men and called upon them to go out and kill and torture Palestinians. He used coded language, Torahic language, Talmudic language. But for anyone who's familiar with that jargon, which was every single person in that audience, it's an extremely clear call to murder. You know, wow. and so um, yeah, this man is absolutely despicable. This is the kind of his, incidentally his co. Uh, co-city councilor from the same slate was a Kahanist who was, you know, jailed on suspicion of uh, stealing uh, weapons to organize to attack and murder Palestinians. Yonatan Yosef, that same person you see in videos talking about, we're going to enter Sheikh Jarrah and this is the how the state does it. We did it in before and we did it again and we're going to just install Jews. This is probably the second video you're going to show me. That guy is his running mate or on the same Kahanist slate for city council. And he himself, in the year 2000, was arrested for plotting to, you know, steal weapons and murder Palestinians. And these people uh, are getting elected to office. Like, that's what's yes, crazy. Yes, They're yes, being elected yes. City to councilors. office. Yes, There's also this crazy the holy city guy. Jerusalem. There's also this crazy guy, this, well, I guess, you know, an Itamar Ben Gavir. Is that how you mm -hmm, say his mm -hmm. name? Yeah, you said um, it right. And he, uh, I mean, he was, like, setting up camp last week in yeah. Sheikh Jarrah uh, to like try and provoke the Palestinians there. Supposedly he was saying he was there to protect the Jews there. Um, but then eventually he packed up and left. But so there was a car ramming uh, during the Israeli police raid on Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, today. And <laughs> he tweeted, I don't know if you saw what he tweeted about it. Did you see? Yalla, let's take over the temple of the it, He tweeted, um, let me see. Hang on. Now I did have it, but now I can't. Hang on. I had it in front of me. It's really crazy what he said. He said, so hang on. Now I have to tell you. It was something along the lines of like, we will take, we will claim back Jerusalem as our own or something. Right. Um, we gotta show them. And then he boss. showed, yeah, I'm gonna show you because then he included the photo. Here it is. Mm. Then he included a uh, the I'm sorry, the image of the actual car ramming, mm. like celebrating mm. it. Mm. Um, mm. here it is. Let me just share this. Mm. Uh. While you're working on that, Itamar ben -Gvir, he's the, the head of the, oh, here we go. There it is. I'm just for the people, uh, for some reason, it's not giving me the option to translate, but can you translate that? Yes. What does it say? We've lost <laughs> sovereignty. <laughs> you have to see me close up because I have to move it. Does that okay. work? How's this? We've we've lost sovereignty in Jerusalem. It's time to uh, liberate once again the Temple Mount and Jerusalem, and to show them who are the owners once and for all. That's what he tweeted, and in for those who are just listening and not watching, he attached that tweet a video of a car ramming by an Israeli 
uh, just like rams his car into Palestinians as the police are raiding the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is around it. Um, and so he was celebrating that essentially uh, and acting as, as some form of liberation. Uh, but yeah, this guy is pretty nuts. He's an open Kahanist. Um, and he is an increasingly popular politician. And I mean, we don't have to go too much into him. The point of everything you're talking about is just there is this growth of these people filling positions in government. Yeah. And that's pretty frightening. I guess this is like, you know, um, this is a question that has more to do with the people who aren't the religious far right. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to ask, you know, um, you know, I've seen, well, okay, like with the Israeli, what, what remains of the Israeli left? I know you said it was very tiny, mm. but regardless, um, how is what remains of the Israeli left reacting to this particular escalation? And is there really any significant Israeli reaction against these Jewish fundamentalists or against this Israeli security response? I don't see it. Wow. Of course, there are some. You know, of course, there are people who are, you know, I see people in my feed, you know, Jew, you know, Israeli Jews in my Facebook feed, you know, sharing posts of what's happening around uh, in East Jerusalem and, and, you know, horrified and, you know, speaking out and calling it openly apartheid and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, that constitutes a very, very, very small segment of Israeli Jewish society. Um, we can see easiest just by looking at the response of the alternative to Netanyahu, you know, the person who has now been given the mandate since Netanyahu failed. He's now been given a mandate to put together a government. Uh, Yair Lapid is his name. So he's the head of the so-called alternative camp. And, you know, you, you, you look at what he's tweeted and it's just like support for the police. We got to show them what's right. It's like almost indistinguished, very, you know, not so different from Itamar ben who who you just spoke of. So that's the, the uh, that's that's the Israeli, you know, centrist response or centrist alternative. And I mean, that's the way it's been. Don't forget before before uh, this dude, um, before Yeshatid, Yair Lapid, who was the head of the alternative to Netanyahu camp, Benny Gantz, the man who was his chief of staff in the army, who started his political career by you know with, with a video of drone footage of bombing Gaza and a death count going up. He was boasting about it. Look how many people, I, Palestinians I killed in Gaza, vote for me. You know, this was his uh, opening foray into Israeli politics. That was the previous leader of the alternative to Netanyahu camp. So this is sadly, as I said, the largest chunk of Israeli society are secular nationalists. And so, yeah, there's the Netanyahu brand on the right, who don't mind being openly racist or mind less being openly racist, but there's those, you know, who still want to be able to sit in, um, you know, a cafe in Vienna and meet with, you know, members of polite society and to still think of themselves as liberal people. So, you know, they have, they have to maintain this image of Israel as, no, it's not, you know, um, to me, it's not, uh, that, that's why I'm not really invested in, you know, unseating Netanyahu because I see that the alternative to him isn't all that much better. But um, so I, I don't I don't see Israelis horrified because the way that they are fed this information, of course, you know, my Twitter feed, I'm seeing Palestinians, you know, sh and Israeli journalists as well. But those who are right there, I'm following the journalists. So I'm seeing footage right from the ground and I'm seeing what's happening on the streets most Israeli Jews don't. They'll see it through very heavily edited and extremely nationalistic, you know, news channels that Netanyahu controls most of, if it's not through his patron Sheldon Adelson, uh, Shmo, as we say, or if it was, it's through, you know, his, you know, deals that he's currently being investigated for, actually for, you know, uh, co you know, corruption deals with bribery between himself and Israeli publishers of newspapers. So, I mean, that's that's the media that most Israelis are fed. They're fed that, you know, the, the Palestinians, the savage Palestinians are, there's no reasoning with them. They just, you know, they're insane and, you know. Whereas, yeah, in America, our media probably makes the, Isra the or the Israeli media probably makes American media seem like pro-Palestine, even though it, it just all ends up being, you know, clashes. Everything's clashes um, between 
two sides that are for some reason fighting each other, but there's like no more depth than that. But mm. I, I do want to ask, I guess I probably know the answer to this already, but I have to ask, um, you know, you've seen these statements from the U.S., Joe Biden's president now. You've seen not just uh, you've seen Antony Blinken speak privately to his Israeli counterparts, as well as Jake Sullivan, asking them to please de-escalate tensions. Uh, Netanyahu doesn't seem to really care too much after what happened today uh, with the with the Ma Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, storming. But you've also had the EU come out and express deep concern. <laughs> but you've also even had statements from Jordan. You've had, you know, condemnation statements from even the U. I think the UAE may have said something. And then also you do have statements from quite a few Democrats in Congress. You know, ob the obvious people like Bernie Sanders, AOC, Elon Omar, but then also even Elizabeth Warren has come out and said, you know, something about these evictions. Chris Murphy has. Joaquin Castro, surprisingly, who's always been a very good ally of APAC, came out and, and basically condemned these evictions in East Jerusalem. Um, I'm wondering, do these kinds of statements mean anything to the Israeli political class at all? Does it matter that Biden's in charge or is it like, whatever, we're going to do whatever we want because we know the Americans are never going to withhold aid from us? It's so far gone. Hmm. It's so, I mean, look, when, when a politician has the audacity to speak out, it's just automatically interpreted as anti-Semitism. Even that's from Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, look, that's, that's that's how it goes here, you know. And so I would, of course, you know, there may be some kind of tipping point at which it'll it'll change. But at this point, no, I don't I don't I don't see that making a difference because you know it's just automatically filtered through. Well, if there's you know, they, it, it's not explained to people that these people are upset by you know the racism that these that. The Palestinians are experiencing. They're, you know, devastated at the dispossession of these Palestinians. No, 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 no. You know, it's only explained to them the filter of these people want to hate Jews and want the Jews to suffer. And you know, like so when it's done. That's really down what to people extent, believe. They genuinely, genuinely believe that. Like they just hate Jews. If you if you if Amer if an American politician like says something against an Israeli policy, people are condition to just assume it's it's Jew hatred? Well, I mean, th this is what they've been told by their politicians. The pol this is how politicians openly speak. And the gongos, you know, the government organized NGOs, you know, are constantly flooding the Israeli uh, discourse with these ideas. And there's no oppositional force in Israeli society to counter that message or that can successfully counter that message. So... House. That's that's what people eat. Mm -hmm. Well, and the also the other side of this too is that you know uh, American Jews are quite different politically, mm. more and more so than Israeli Jews at mm. this point. Um, and so recently, the former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., um, Ron Dermer, had suggested I think it was yesterday he suggested that Israel should prioritize the passionate and unequivocal support of evangelical Christians <laughs> over that of American Jews, who he said are disproportionately among our critics. Do Israelis get that? Do Israelis get that their leadership is trying to align with like evangelical Christians in the U.S. who really only care about Israel, as we know, to like bring about the rapture, um, which is quite anti-Semitic in and of itself? Mm -hmm. Is that understood at all? And what do like do Israelis just is there an, an, an like is there a recognition that American Jews tend to have different politics than they do, or is that not even a part of the conversation? Most of the time, it's not even a part of the conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you how these groups fit into the Israeli mindset. So you talked about the evangelicals that are, you know, turning out to be the strongest base of support for Zionism in U.S. society and in Congress. So these groups don't have any interaction with the average Israeli. OK, they come here on tours, you know, and they're given tours of the West Bank by Israeli settlers, by Kahanist settlers, I should add. And so they're shown all, you know, oh, look at these vineyards that we planted. Look at this, this, you know, gives them the sense of, wow, you know, the Bible's coming true. The rapture is coming. So um, it's, you know, it, 
Israeli politicians are happy to bring these evangelicals to the country, um, but they don't interact with average Israelis or anything like that. They have very little in common, in fact, with average Israelis, just as they have very little in common with most American Jews. They may have more in common with Orthodox American Jews, uh, sharing with them right-wing views on other topics like school uh, you know, payments and abortions and blah, 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 all the other right-wing things we think of. But Orthodox Jews are only 10% of American Jewish society. Most of American Jewish society are belong to liberal streams of Judaism. Right. And most of them have, you know, along, you know, just along the list have nothing to do, no, no connection politically with evangelicals and, and our political opponents. But in, you have the Israeli ex-foreign minister or ex-ambassador to the U.S. saying, these are the people we need to invest in. I'm not surprised. This is the message. The message is that liberal Jews, and it's not just them, it's like ministers throughout the last decade of Netanyahu's you know, time and tenure in office. We have continually ministers saying this. What do you need American Jewry for? Anyways, all these liberal reformies are going to die off in a generation or two anyways. So what if they're complaining about you know, because occasionally the liberal Jewish groups do actually, you know, issue a statement of, you know, decrying some dispossession, whether it's Palestinians or African refugees or whatnot. Occasionally, you know, it usually, you know, they, they do speak out. It's usually when their own interests are threatened, but occasionally they will speak out against, you know, uh, discriminatory treatment. And, and when that happens, Israeli ministers say, yalla, go to hell, you American Jews. We don't need you. You're going to be gone anyways. You know, you're going to be wiped out pretty soon. So uh, don't bother us. You you can go to hell. Jesus. This is the attitude of Israeli ministers. So I, I just, um, and, and, and when it comes down to the Israeli population, it's either uh, those, the same disdain or else uh, you're just naive. You're just so naive. You'll never understand it unless you live here. Only if you live here would you understand. Right. Dot, dot, it's dot. like you're not, you're not on the front lines like we are kind of mentality. Right. But I think that actually being in North America or Europe or other parts of the world, a place where Jews and non-Jews, Arabs, Palestinians can actually meet each other on an equal level, not in the apartheid sphere, but actually means that they have a better sense of who Arab people are, Palestinian right. people are, than the ones who can only get to meet them under conditions of apartheid. Where they're but, like uh, policing them yeah. as soldiers, uh, or uh, uh, right? Right, or or exactly, or, or always with the knowledge, or or always with the knowledge that if anything ever goes down, I just need to call the cops, and they'll always come to my side over your side because they're just ingrained bias. So. As we've seen in video after video, so you're explaining how like the left and right in Israel. Um, used to, I mean, I think it used to mean one's views about the conflict with, you know, other Arab states or with Palestinians. But now, as you're saying, there's sort of near unanimity, I guess, among Israelis about those issues. Um, and it's more about secular versus religious. So how do you see that divide worsening or expanding? Because it doesn't sound from what you're saying that you see any opportunity for reversal here. Mm. <clears throat> no. Well, I mean, on one hand, let's look at the country, you know, half the population of, I'm talking from the river to the sea, just bare statistics, half the population of the country is Jewish, half the population of the country is Palestinian. So if it was all, everyone, one person, one it's vote. democratic, yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. But, you know, how do we get to that point? Is it possible to get to that point? Today, Israeli society, I don't see it happening within Israeli society because, as you pointed out, the vast majority of votes, because so few, so many people, you know, two thirds of the Palestinian people are disenfranchised, don't have the right to vote for the government that rules them, and so that you know because of that, Jewish votes are disproportionately powerful. And uh, since you know people are more likely to support a system that benefits them, surprise, surprise, mm -hmm. you know, most Israeli Jews do support Jewish supremacy here. Um, the issue is, okay, what's going to change? What, what about looking forward? Is it possible that there's going to be a, sway, a, a change in mindset amongst Israeli Jews to the point where they can see Palestinians and other non-Jews as their equal in the land? 
the pro there's several problems. One of them, statistically, every year, Israelis are just becoming more and more racist. They're being polled. Do you, would you be willing to live with an Arab in the same building? Would you be willing to send your kid to sit in the same classroom as a Palestinian, et cetera, et cetera? And every year, the answers become a little bit more racist. So as opposed to other parts of the world where you know, we have hope that even if there's you know, expressions of racism now, of extreme racism, you know, hopefully they'll die out as the churn, you know, show uh, you know the children are all right and they come out and they speak out and they overthrow their asshole parents so in israel unfortunately that's not the case the kids are more racist than their parents statistically um yeah it's a, it's a scary thought and you know less people even remember what it was once like when you could interact you know, with yeah. palestinians even yeah. right yeah yeah because there's yeah. really like extreme separation at this point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm living in a very, very, very small bubble in Haifa, in a neighborhood that's mixed, in a building that's mixed, but that's, you know, 0.0001% of society that has that experience here. Um, Israeli high schools, you know, it's, teachers are afraid to, you know, even when it's time to, it's civics class, you know, there's a section on civics, you have to speak about human rights. It's an element of human history, you know, but teachers will specifically skip those chapters because they know in advance that as soon as they raise the issue you're going to have students in the class start screaming you know fucking kill all the arabs you know uh, you know just like genocidal shit so just being afraid the to raise the issue of the country. yeah, yeah. Well, these are the, there's no yeah. effort to push back against that racism there was a report a government report a couple years ago and it found that the israeli government purposefully avoided prevent you know doing it making any effort to prevent racism they actively did so so okay so you have this country that has nuclear weapons it's armed to the teeth by 3.8 billion dollars in you know military aid from the u.s um with no end in sight and it sounds like what you're saying is that society is being overtaken by an increasingly genocidal view of the people with whom they have full control over, who are pretty much defenseless at this point, um, which sounds really terrifying for the future of this area of this region. Um, so I'm curious, like, how do you expand that out? What is this growing religious fundamentalism that's taking over Israeli politics? Mm -hmm. What is their view of the rest of the region? Do they have mm -hmm. aspirations for, you know, further expanding mm -hmm. Israel's already loose borders, if you will, um, like even beyond taking over pal more Palestinian areas. Sure. Yeah. You know, we, I think when we talk about kind of the, the rise of the the second elite in Israel, we're, you know, the, re the religious elite, we're talking about a movement that really began in earnest in the mid 2000s. And it really happened when there was that uh, withdrawal from Gaza, when the Israeli settlements when the Israeli settlers were removed from Gaza and when the Israeli army camps and soldiers were removed from Gaza. Uh, at that point, you know, the, the religious camp made strenuous efforts to prevent that withdrawal, you know, um, and they were unsuccessful in doing so. And when that happened, and the reason why is because most secular Jews didn't care, weren't because to them, it's just like, OK, there's like a million Palestinians and 5000 Jews. Yalla, what are, what are you Jews even doing there, <laughs> you know? So that, that was the attitude of most secular Israeli nationalists. So they didn't object. Most Israeli secular didn't object. The religious were, in, you know, because the, the religious, um, the orthodox understanding in the, of, is that all of Israel must be liberated, right? There must be a total, you know, complete, you know, domination over all of the land. And so th when they realized that they were unable to prevent this, they said, okay, w we need to get into positions of power. We need, if before we weren't interested, now we need to send our best youth to become journalists, to become, you know, you know, t t in positions of, of influence in the education ministry. So this never happens. So this never happens again, basically. So we never right. remove a single so, settler from anywhere. Exactly. So that we, so that we, you know, our values become society's values. So, so in the last 15 years, you see a trickling down of this, both at the level of like 
people in positions of power making decisions and in terms of their ideology seeping into the mainstream. And that's why a movement that, you know, in 2005, the idea that Jews were going to try to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque and turn it into a Jewish temple, that was seen even by most Israeli Jews, even most religious Israeli Jews as like, whoa, that is insane. That's, you know, that's a far-flung extremist messianic vision that is that we're opposed to. But in the last 15 years, they have managed, you know, the messianic right has managed to convince Israeli secular Israelis that this is important, not for religious reasons. Don't worry, we're, you know, they don't talk about we want to turn the country into a theocracy and we'll persecute, you know, we'll kill gays and we'll kill women who are idolatrous and all this stuff, adulterous, whatever. No, they don't talk about that. They said we need the, uh, you know, the, the temple because as long as Palestinians are there, it's like a spitting in our eye. It's like peeing in our face. It's, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like the biggest insult to us that the place that's most important, our national symbol, it's like, a you know, of course, from the Palestinian perspective, you, you know, you Israeli Jews have taken over the entire country. This is the last little piece of land that we have control over in Jerusalem. There's no green space. This is the last, you know, public space that we have, you know, and so, but from the Israeli perspective, it's completely inverted, you know, like, yeah. It's a, it, <laughs> so they, but they've actually convinced, they've managed to convince uh, increasing numbers of secular Israelis in recent years that taking the temp, the Al-Aqsa Mas, the Haram al-Sharif from the Muslim, from the Palestinians and turning it into a Jewish area bit by bit is actually, it's, it's be, like, it's become a successful movement in recent years. Like, it's, they, they like portray it as like a security issue? Like, no, pride, okay. national pride. They, okay. they portray it as an issue of is this is an, a national embarrassment. It's an insult to our, to our, to our peoplehood, you know? Wow. And, and so they've managed to convince people, you know, if let's say if a Palestinian kid is kicking a soccer ball on Haram al Sharif, then that's, the insult to them you know that is the provocation to them that's what will incite them and so they have waged a war in recent years and now they have not dozens but tens of thousands you know that tens of thousands of people going jews i mean tens of thousands of religious jews going visiting the haram al-sharif every year with the intention of increasing that number until you know by hook or by crook it's just like a, a critical mass has been passed and then the government has no choice but to, you know, take the, you know, accept the decision of the people and fulfill its desire and judify, judify the Haram al-Sharif. That's their hope. And the numbers are increasing every year. I, I don't know if they're going to get to that point where it's a critical mass of secular Israelis are fooled into supporting this messianic movement. I don't know if we need to get to that point you know it we may sounds, even mean, before even, then break out into race war full on i mean yeah it sounds like that's where so that was gonna be my next my one of my last questions he was gonna be like what does the future hold as israel continues this lurch to the far right with, mm -hmm. with seemingly no obstacles in place to prevent it mm -hmm. um palestinians are not in a position to prevent really anything i mean what do they have mm -hmm. rocks mm -hmm. um and like you know uh, there's hamas in gaza but Gaza is like just this ghetto that, you know, um, mm. has been successfully besieged for all this time. So Palestinians aren't an obstacle. The Americans are clearly not an obstacle. Mm. So it seems like the only solution can be imposed. Uh, mm. But there's no one outside willing to impose it, which is to force Israel to stop right. um, and to, you know, to stop their racist policies. So like, What's the end game here? Like, does Israel just get to go on and become a crazy theocratic country? Like, what do you foresee happening? I know it's just a guessing game because we really can't right. predict, but right. it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere pretty, but towards more bloodshed, mostly on the Palestinian side. Yeah. Well, everyone just yeah. kind of watches in horror helplessly. Yeah. It's a very yeah. cynical view, but <laughs> I don't. I've be I've I think that in recent years I have become more cynical and less hopeful. I'm sad to say. Also, I've seen a lot of my friends leave the country. You know, the people who were fighting or making efforts to roll back the racism have often said, "Is like I can't imagine raising my kids here. I want to give my kids something better than this. I don't want them to receive an education in this country." So they've 
they've moved, they've gone, if it's to Europe or US or wherever. And so it's become, I'll admit, it's become more lonely because uh, there's fewer people fighting. I don't mean to take away from everyone out in the streets who's making an effort, you know, it's, but like you said, there doesn't seem to be any force that's powerful enough to roll back the racism. So I don't have a lot of hope. Um, I think that there's been a real missed opportunity by folks who, you know, aspire towards equality. They could be using this opportunity to speak openly about one state because the whole structure of the, of the political system in Israel is now up in the air, you know? Netanyahu could, basically there could be, the only reason we don't have a government right now is because most Israeli politicians hate Arabs more than they hate Netanyahu. And for that reason, we don't have a government right now. And we haven't had really a working government for two years. So um, this is the perfect time with this instability for new ideas, you know, to be, because if we don't, the new idea that's going to be accepted, that's being floated out is, okay, well, I guess this apartheid isn't working because, you know, these Palestinians, we can't just keep oppressing them, you know, because then, it, you know, there's going to be blowback. There's going to, surprise, surprise, when you oppress people, sometimes they are violent in response. So, you know, maybe the next idea that rolls forward is, oh, we, we can't afford to have them amongst us. We need to, you know, just literally remove them completely altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People need, there's no horizon if you don't present a horizon. And I think that um, the few folk here who, who do aspire to see one democratic state are, you know, I, I think that they're dropping the ball because this is the perfect opportunity right now to speak out with a campaign and stand behind it and, and then draw people to it, give them something to be excited by, inspired by, hopeful about. But if they don't do so, if no one does so, if, you know, I don't think that there's any reason why am I supposed to be inspired by the slightly less racist party in yeah. the parliament, you know? What I mean? Right, right. Um, you know, so it just, I, it, what's, what's really crazy to me is everything you're describing obviously mm. sounds very dark for the future, but mm. also for some of these Western journalists that are based there. I mean, I guess I, for those who don't speak the language, I could see how it would be difficult for them to maybe understand the rhetoric and media and narrative around them and just how racist it is, although I still don't excuse them. But then there's others where I'm just like, I'm just still shocked. Like there's certain New York Times journalists like Isabel Kirshner, for example, like you're American. Like, how, like I just don't understand how people like that, they know what's happening in Israeli society and they're still covering for it. You're from a country that is very mixed i mean obviously america i'm not downplaying america be america is a white supremacist settler colonial country but not like israel, israel is just a really extreme version of it and i just don't understand how these journalists can be there on the ground seeing what's happening and still excuse this nastiness mm -hmm. i'm just making a comment here and also just yeah. wondering what your reaction is to that because you're mm -hmm. there too and i think you've worked with a lot of journalists and you've probably witnessed this mm -hmm. in person like what's behind like why why this effort to to like cover up the dirty side of Israeli society? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that um look it's it's difficult I think that if we examine people's politics, often you know people kind of they aren't as strict about their own folks. They aren't as critical about their own community. Sometimes, we, you know, take one political position for society in general, and then we let our own folks off the hook. That may play a part of it. And it's unfortunate that, you know, we have this record where any group that sends representatives to this country, they're, instead of just sending a representative of that country, they're sending Jewish representatives of the country. Well, right, Isabel Kirshner has, I think, like one of her kids is actually an Israeli soldier, which exactly. is a huge conflict of interest. Exactly, continue, <laughs> so. and she's not, the, she's not the only one Right. who's you know, headed the New York Times department in Jerusalem, who's had their child serving in the Israeli army. And it's in the same way we have is US ambassador to Israel, Canadian ambassador to Israel, who they send Jewish ambassadors. And then after their terms, they end up staying in the country, continuing 
to live in the country. But they have family there and they have like an like interest the, to, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, no problem with moving to the country. You know, everyone, every Palestinian refugee should be allowed to return. People should be allowed to move to the, immigrate to the country. But here we have like, there's no, it's like, it, you know, it seems like the Zionist lobby is so powerful and so sure of its strength that it doesn't mind uh, insisting upon, you know, and demanding the most egregious exceptions. Yeah. You know, the exceptionalism that would not be considered appropriate if any other, you know, ethnic group, but in the case of Israel, it's allowed, we get a pass. And this is what, if that's the environment, just imagine, you know, for journalists who want to eat, who want a regular paycheck, who want to be able to buy a house someday, they realize that if they don't take the line and they don't, you know, Right. Center there's obviously Israel's there's narrative. like a you get attacked yeah. for for seeming yeah. to be too pro Palestine. Obviously, people have yeah. been fired for that in the media. But I guess you yeah. know the same could actually be said for some of the people who end up getting to cover other parts of the Middle East. Like they'll be tied to like they're covering Syria. They're tied to like Syrian opposition in mm. ways that aren't disclosed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, the same goes for like Lebanon. It's like definitely the interests of people and their own politics and familial politics mm, definitely mm. play a role in how things get covered for mm. sure. On that note, I, I thank you so much for taking, mm. is there anything else, David, before we, before I close that you want to like bring up that we didn't already cover? <laughs> <laughs> well, so much to say, but I'll just end on one little note because you mentioned Itamar Ben Gvir, the head of the Jewish Power Party in the government. It's called the He's, Jewish Power Party? Jesus no Christ. No shame. Straight <laughs> up about it, Jewish Power. And it's like white just most, power. Yes, I'm yes, sorry, yes, like, straight up. The white Power Party, okay. I encourage folks who you know are kind of maybe not as well versed in this material, if they want to do a deeper dive I suggest you watch a lecture I did at the University of Zurich a couple of years ago called Messiah Mode. So if you do a search on YouTube for Messiah Mode, David Sheen, then it's like a hour and a half lecture where I break down the Jewish Power Party, the history of the Kahana movement and why we're at where we are right now. So check that out and davidsheen.com for more information, articles, videos and such. David, thank you so much for coming on Dispatches for Breakthrough News. I hope to have you on sometime in the future with maybe not as deeply dark a note, but thank you mm. so much. Thank mm, you very much. My pleasure.